Hi there, and welcome to episode 25 of the OGV Energy Let's Talk Transition podcast. I'm Murray Melhuish, one of the principal consultants at Anup Consulting. If you want to grow your business in the energy transition and need support with strategy and market entry, Anup Consulting can help. Get in touch and let's discuss how. Now on Let's Talk Transition, we set out to meet people truly leading the energy transition. And today's episode is a great example of that. Living at the intersection of the renewable energy storage, offshore wind, wave, subsea and resident AUV industries, Verloom is one of the most innovative energy transition businesses around. So I for one am excited to find out more. Welcome to the show, Richard Knox. Thanks, Murray. Thank you for the introduction. Richard, can you just introduce yourself, please, and tell us um, a little bit more about Verloom as well? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Richard Knox. I'm CEO and the founder of, of Verloom. Um, so um, by trade, I'm a, an engineer. I'm a chartered mechanical engineer. Um, I graduated way back in uh, 99, um, but spent most of my career prior to, to setting up Verloom uh, working in subsea engineering, um, so lots of kind of yellow bits of steel, subsea Christmas trees, uh, drilling equipment. So quite departed from what we're uh, what we're working on now. Um, and I guess part of that um, journey gave me exposure to the offshore environment and, and an understanding of some of the potential energy that was out there that could be used. So um, that was really part of the driver for for setting up volume because I was passionate around looking at how we could take that learning experience and move that into the marine renewable energy space. Brilliant. So, you know, yeah. marine renewable energies in Verloom, um, you know, Verloom is really interesting. Tell us a little bit more about what it is that you're doing and what you're, what the company's position in the energy transition is. Um, well, I guess there's, there's sort of two sides to the story. One is a kind of journey that's got us to where, where we are now and um, rather than a a great master plan and one is um, just a kind of passion for taking the experience that a lot of our team have had including myself from subsea engineering and oil and gas and then using that to, to the benefit of the marine renewable energy sector so um, back when the business was first started um, there was a lot of um, companies trying to go f- uh, establish marine renewable energy power converters and they went straight to grid um, and I thought that, that you know that would be the first example of any kind of technology that's basically taking such a big leap. Nearly everything else has some form of stepping stones to get there. Um, and at the time, um, there was quite a lot of divisiveness around what's renewables and what's oil and gas, and a real um, uh, sometimes hostility, but around using some of the experience from the oil and gas industry. So um, I kind of felt that you know if that works in terms of going straight to good, great. But if not, let's see if we can find another path of, of building these technologies up so that we can have a, a more sustainable future that uses remain renewable energy. Um, and so it was around focusing on rather than what's the cheapest electricity, it's like what things can we use renewable energy for at the highest value to give us a, an easier commercial entry and then build that up over time to ultimately get to the same place, but maybe a bit of a kind of hair and tortoise way. So maybe we're going to get a bark on the back ourselves on the on the uh, tortoise. So um realised quite quickly that if any um, application that wasn't necessarily going straight to grid, you needed some form of energy storage um, because it always needed to have power and demand. So we first started out looking at what the, the intermittency was of various power generation sources. Um, and, th- and this was for the, you know, at the kind of very start of the business and, and tidal energy was the most predictable. So the thinking at that time was well, if we plug for tidal energy and then combine it with an energy storage system effectively make the same as a hybrid drive for a car, then um, then that's probably going to be the best solution for providing just watts of power for things in seabed like monitoring and uh, data collection, etc. So we started down that journey, secured some funding um, from Scottish Enterprise, and um, we got some external f- uh, funding from Archer Ventures as well to build our very first full scale prototype, which was a world first tidal energy system converted with uh, energy storage. And through that journey, um, what we found was that um, the challenge had always been around the power generation size because how we were using it, um, that wasn't the issue. It was actually, we tried to port um, technology from the electric vehicle market and use it underwater. And it was really a completely different use case and it was super inefficient and we couldn't find 
um, any sort of um, efficient technology that we could use. So we realized, well, if we don't develop our own, then the whole business isn't going to exist because it's going to be so fundamental to what we do. And at the same time, we'd been talking to a lot of potential users and they had been, I guess, maybe a little bit pessimistic around what we we're doing. But when they saw that we'd actually deployed a system, this was back in 2017, and it worked, they became much more proactive in terms of engaging with us. Um, and that then, they started giving us data, but what we found is where, where there was energy to convert and where they wanted to use it generally, we're quite often in two different places or the size of the market. Specifically, I thought that was going to be quite small. Um, <clears throat> but then we realised that this problem around energy management storage wasn't specific to Tidal. It was going to affect any kind of renewable energy source. source. So pivot the whole business around that. And then from that point on, you know, they've kind of grown the business around energy management and storage and being really quite agnostic about how we store the energy. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, so that's kind of the journey. So the master plan wasn't necessarily to be as what we are now, but it was a kind of a passion and enthusiasm of commercially enabling renewable energy and then finding a way that we could help solve that problem. And you know, the, the um the thing that really kind of lended itself to our expertise was that these were systems and use cases initially on the seabed. The company was set up with a bunch of subsea engineers. So that's kind of and then we had to kind of learn a lot and get expertise from elsewhere to help us kind of build up the, the management and store side of things. Really and Richard, when did you set the business up? Uh, April 2013. First of April, April 2013. 2013. <laughs> Yeah, so, it was our very first contract, and it luckily started um, on the uh, you know, start of the tax year, which was extremely handy and just a bit of a fluke, to be honest with you. But that's why it awesome. sits in the memory. Brilliant. So, Richard, you were founded in 2013. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. So you're you know just over 10 years old, which is brilliant. And um, what sort of footprint have you got today? Yeah, so we've got two offices in uh, Aberdeen in, in Scotland. So one is in the Bridgeton Industrial Estate, which is our sort of head office. And then uh, we have a operations facility uh, outside the airport, which is 18,000 square feet. Um, and we also have quite a bit of business in, um, in the US. So we have um, so a sales support representation over there as well. Oh, and, and great. So we, have, um, I guess 30, so we have 31 employees today. Um, we've got five new starts uh, this month and next month, um, and then we've got another sort of five or six open positions that we're looking to fill. So, <laughs> yeah. five to six yeah. open positions. Do you want to share with us what type yeah, of positions so, you're so there, for just now? Yeah, so um, some of the most recent ones we've had two that we've just filled that are engineering based. Others are uh, more in terms of uh, accounts and uh, sort of support, other kind of business support functions, um, but. Um, particularly around the sort of engineering is kind of where we're going to go now. Great. And, you know, it's brilliant to see the, um, well, the innovation and the growth of the business. Yeah. But you've had some really uh, positive news recently, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot happened in this, this last year. And I think one of the biggest seeds for that was um, the the competition, the innovation competition that we won with, with RWE. So, you know, as I mentioned at the start, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing has been around um, how do you kind of scale up to to, to good scale. So um, one of the um, tenders in the Dutch sector for an offshore wind farm was on Swiss Twist uh, 7. Um, half the um, the scoring as to who the offshore wind developer was that's going to win the lease was based around system integration. So how could you stabilise power? while it's offshore before it gets it gets onshore to, to be used to try and make the whole system a lot more efficient, keep keep um, renewables more stable. So we um we worked with RWE on their on their bid as after winning that innovation competition and, and we secured the contract for that. So that's going to be the world's first um uh, offshore battery connected directly to an offshore wind turbine. So that's a really big contract. So that's kind of given us the cornerstone for uh, moving that side to business. But at the same time um We've also had a lot of success around the renewable subsea power project, which is the collaboration project we've been working with Motion for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, so that couples um, a wave energy device with our own energy storage, and then that allows you to power terms and door vehicles, monitor equipment, control equipment, etc. So that was originally supported um, and you know, through the NZTC, and then in terms of industry players. Um, 
Hardware Energy in Serica were the, were the first. Um, then we had uh, PTEP, who are the Thai national oil company. So they are, uh, um, you know, brought an international element to that project. And now um, the press release came out just quite recently that, that uh, Total Energies have joined. So, you know, that, you know they, they have been the driver of offshore electrification, subsea electrification um, for decades. So having them on board has been great. Um, and, um, it's not official yet, but there's one other uh, major operator away to join that collaboration as, as well. And then, you know, there's been ourselves and uh, Motion as the sort of two technology drivers, but we've, you know, we've also had a lot of um, support through, you know, working with um, Baker Hughes. They've been, they've been, they've been part of that. Um, so take us yeah. through that sort of infrastructure because you've got Motion Energy and, of course, mm -hmm. some of our um audience will remember that we had Cameron McNatt, yeah, Chief Executive right, yeah, yeah, of Motion yeah. Energy on the show in episode five. Um mm -hmm. now so you've got the motion energy wave energy conversion device and mm -hmm. that is that's generating right. the power. You've then yeah. got your device storing the power. Yeah so basically the, the motion system converts any wave energy. So um so it, it's a power generation and communication um portal. So in terms of getting the communication from the seabed to the surface and all the kind of technologies, you either transfer through your seawater or you can transfer through air and you can't do can't effectively do both. So um so we become the, the gateway and the storage element and interface on the seabed to all the equipment. There's then a cable goes up to the, the motion system which we send comms up to and they send power down to. Um and then that um can provide on, on that particular system it's a 4G connection and um, we've got a uh, long bandwidth radio on it as well but it could also be a satellite connection so the the, the two bits of the system provide the whole uh, which becomes known as this sort of renewable for subsea power generation so it becomes a it's a it's effectively a power and communication uh, microgrid um is this what's created by by the two elements together so yeah and richard why is subsea the right place to store the energy I, well it's not the obvious place um and it was handy for us but um, there's there's a few things around, well, around batteries which can be challenges when you try to put them offshore. One's they're very heavy, and two is um, batteries perform best when they're kept at a stable temperature. Um, so um, one on the heavy side is any any mass that you want to put and keep afloat, or um, you know with a solid structure or floating structure, effectively adds to the mass of what you've got there, so it might not be obvious, um, but that actually adds a lot more cost. Um, so as soon as you know, so you either wrap the batteries in steel, keep or whatever medium you want, but you wrap them in steel, keep them in the seabed, or you need the extra steel at surface. And any time we've looked at it, um, it's more cost effective just to kind of wrap what you've got in steel and keep it and keep it dry. Um, and then there's a the temperature side of it. So um, the way that we operate our system, the the temperature uh, that's generated when you're mainly when you're charging the battery systems it's just transferred to the wall of the pipe and then it uses the, the water around it as like a big big great heat sink to, to take the power out and because we do that and it, and then we don't need effectively um it removes the need for any um climate conditioning equipment or temperature control equipment within the system by removing that you've then removed all the mechanical moving parts which need maintained so then you remove the need for any kind of maintenance. It becomes a sort of zero maintenance system. So you can put the system for 10 years and not touch it. So if you have that at surface, then you need climate control systems. Then you need access for people to go in and maintain them. You've got the cost of maintaining them. So once you do the full life cycle, it's actually much more cost effective to put it on the seabed. Now, um, that's not the most logical place to start, I guess, unless you're a subsea engineer, which is kind of maybe where we become quite interesting because that is the kind of background of the business. And we thought, we were going to have to take what we're doing in the original system subsea, bit surface, and anything we looked at it, wait a minute, we're just wasting our time. That's not the way to. That's not the way to do it. So, um, it's fortuitous rather than visionary for one of a better term. But um, you know, it's it works. And you know, how much power can be stored, Richard? And what are the use cases? You know, how are these businesses using that power? Yeah, it's, so it tends to there's, there's quite a kind of step change. In different sizes and use cases. So um, there's a lot of use cases below 20 kilowatts, and some of them might be even like five five kilowatts. That's as an output power. So you can be doing anything from the five kilowatts 
like charging an NUV to um, power in a remote environmental system or anything like that. So somewhere in the sort of sub 20 kilowatts. Then um, you can kind of step up to 200 and 250 kilowatts, and then you find a, a number of use cases around things that are maybe using pumps and um, mechanical systems like that. And, and there's not really much between the, the 20 and the sort of 200, 250. And then again, there's another massive jump where you can get up to this sort of one megawatt, two megawatt hour, uh, sorry, one megawatt, two megawatt power output. And that's when you're kind of really working at kind of grid scale and, and, and help it kind of balance balance the grid and, and, other, and other services around that. So it's it's very much kind of environmental information gathering, sensors, small scale charging to pops and, and other ancillary equipment, chemical injection systems to, and then really kind of big scale. And then when you hit this at one megawatt, two megawatt sizes, that then also correlates the same sort of power outputs that you need for um, charging sort of surface vessels or, you know, hybrid electric vessels etc like that so there's kind of three three um bandings and we and that's from a power output side but then from a a, um, a storage side so our our um battery enclosures they're all kind of roughly the size you know, between some between 1500 kilowatt hours depending on how you've configured it which is a small from a small electric vehicle up to like a, a tesla more or less basically you can stack those so if you're looking at environmental ones and you maybe need two three hundred Kilo hours, maybe up to even like a megawatt hour, and a single skid will do lots of the kind of smaller scale stuff. And then, um, you know, the, the scale that we're looking at with with grid balance, and um, you can go anything to sort of two, three, four, five megawatt hour um, quite easily. Technically, you can go well beyond that, but you get to, to a point where um, it's actually going to be more cost effective longer term to move to a different storage medium like hydrogen or some some other other form because um, you know, they're just actually creating hydrogen and putting it in an empty tank rather than having lots of, of battery cells. So um, where, where that break point is, don't know yet. Um, and it'll very much be sensitive around the cost point of battery technology and electrolyzers, etc. But um, there is a point at which it just becomes um, better to change a different medium. But that is um, up to sort of even, we've looked at things as far as 200 megawatt hours, huge, huge systems. but. That's when you start getting into moving on to seasonal balance, and so not just intermittency, local intermittency. It's actually seasonal balance, and so people are looking at things like uh, storing energy into disused uh, oil and gas reserves and things, because effectively the structure for storage is, is already there. But that's kind of getting outside of my field of knowledge by quite some way. <laughs> but, yeah. And Richard, you know, you're growing pretty quickly. Um, uh-huh. And yeah. in fact, let, let, I, I noticed a press release from you recently, and actually. You know, you've grown your order book tenfold with a 400% increase in revenue. And of course, you've also um, just told us that basically you've got another five new starts just coming into the business just right. now with another five or six positions. So, so it's impressive growth, but you're still in that sort of small, medium sized sector. And yet you're managing to partner with some massive businesses. You know, you've mentioned Total Energies, uh, RWE, PTTEP. Um, how have you found that? How easy has that been? It depends on the, the organisations. I think the ones that we've found the easiest to work with are, um, and quite a few of them that you've mentioned have done this, are ones who have got specific innovation teams. So I think like generally, just irrespective of the industry, Large, large corporates find it quite, quite difficult to innovate. Um, you know, and but they recognise that most innovation effectively tends to start in small SMEs like ourselves. So, nearly all of them that we are working with have, I guess, acknowledged that and specifically set up innovation teams to work with companies such as ourselves. So, um, and it would, I mean, I don't know how to. Do, is the right way to describe it. It's almost they, they become the friendly face of the big corporate. So there's sort of that interface and the gateway into the larger organization. So although like it like um an RW team um that working with we're working directly in team delivering that wind farm, but prior to that, um and, and we're still engaged with the sort of innovation team that they set up. Um Baker Hughes have done done similar other, you know, Total Energies, for example, are well known for um research and development and and and, and having an innovation team, etc. So 
Um, I think that's there's been a, a, um, an enthusiasm with us to work with these larger organisations because they're the ones effectively that are going to be using our, our product. So it's all happened to me quite recently, but that's been, I guess, years of work really interacting with them. Um, but also, I think some of the benefit is that um, myself included, and a number of people that work in the, the team are used to working with big OEMs and having companies like these as, their, as our customers. So the way in which we uh, operate and behave as an organisation, when we're interacting with these customers, probably feels to them, and the feedback is that that's the case. I think we're a much bigger organisation than we are just because we're used to. So you know, some of the, um, um, I guess, uh, assumptions that you might work about an SME doesn't necessarily always apply if you've got the right kind of people within that within the organisation. I think that's how we've how we've managed it, and also. Um, a lot of the way that we kind of structure ourselves and execute projects um, from my old legacy, so sort of subsidy on gas project, actually worked really well when we're working with the renewable industry. Um, it's easy to think that that might not be the case, but the kind of very kind of structural report way in terms of doing project management, etc., and document registers, how you plan projects, etc., how you execute interfaces, etc. Um, you know, we've done. I think we've done pretty pretty well with that, and that. Richard, one of the challenges of growing a business um, is always finding the right investment. Um, how much yeah. of a challenge has that been to you? Um, I think as the years have gone, it's become it's become easier. But um, when you're when you're looking for investment, you're you're in effect a competitive marketplace. There's always people, other people are looking for investment that people could investors could give them their capital rather than you. Um, and we've been at the end of the spectrum in the initial years where hardware was seen as not being sexy, but hardware, offshore, energy sector, we were the, the furthest extreme of what, what people were, were looking for. Um, and so that was quite difficult. But at the same time, and you, know, you mentioned you had Mark Monroe, and, and so in more recent times, you have much more strategic investors, like the, so like the Scottish National Investment Bank. So, you know, one of the um, benefits of building big bits of hardware and technology like, the, like ours is that you know it needs people and needs um support from the wider su supply chain so we're subcontracting a lot of work locally and it then has a wider economic impact so you know we recruit more people we're training people and for strategic investors such as scottish national investment bank that's something that's kind of high up in their metrics and with some of the other investors that we've we've had in the past with us um so finding the right investor that aligns with what you're doing has been really important i mean obviously you have to have an exciting investable proposition it needs to be in somewhere that there's you know large market opportunity but um i think we spent quite a lot of time trying to align what we were doing well, you know engaging with investors that would align to what we were trying to achieve um, rather than um uh, going to kind of um kind of more traditional route because there's no point us trying to compete with someone who's used to investing in a fintech app you know yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so finding the like, Right, people to, to match what we're doing is probably the, the best way to describe it, I think. Right, and you know, would you have any advice for other SME owners and uh, founders out there that are looking for investment? Well, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, so you can never start too soon, even if it's too early for you to um, to um, necessarily be going out and, and raising the money. Um, it is to be engaging with the investment community, get to know them so you can better understand what they are looking for. So when it is the right time, you, you've already kind of sort of established some form of, of relationship with them. Um, but also, um, you know, if you're looking at, you know, this is the sort of energy transition um, podcast, if you're thinking of transitioning, I think one of the things to that, that a lot of it companies will underestimate is the, the capabilities and skill sets they've got. So a lot of companies look at the product and say, okay, how, how can we take this product X and Y? Then transfer it to say offshore wind, and um, but that product was built or designed using the kind of whole lot of sets of skills and capabilities. And I think it's really easy to to um, underestimate what those case skills and capabilities are. So you can uh, spend a lot of time looking at what the market needs, what problems they have, and see if are there any of those can your product. Well, first of all, it's easiest if your product can can meet them. But nine times out of ten, that may not be the case. So what can what can you use within your business to actually help you diversify? In, in, in um enter a market that that's massively grown and, and creates that exciting opportunity to then ultimately get you the investment but 
you know, it needs to be there um, for specific use. There's no point investment for investment's sake. There's a lot of hard work to get these things over the line. But yeah, there's, um, and, and as I mentioned at the start, hardware and energy weren't sexy um, 10 years ago, but that, because it's part of the solution um, to create a more sustainable future in the energy transition, that market is much, much more attractive than it ever was before. You know, it's it's completely different now to how it was when we first started. So um, there's much, much more investors being strategic and got specific remits from their ultimate um, investors as to what they want to see them invest in. And so that will help a lot of people in a way that um, it's 10 times better than it ever was in the past. And, you know, your business has been growing quickly. Its innovations appear to be well are beginning to be well adopted by the industry. And, and what's the future? What's the vision? What, you know, yeah. in 10 years time, what will be, what will Verloom look like? Um, well, you can never know for, for sure, but um, I mean, it has, I guess it's going quickly now, but it has been quite a long journey. So if you look at any kind of, kind of technology growth, you know, you kind of mentioned the sort of percentages, but you have the good old kind of hockey stick. You know, we've, we've been, in terms of sales revenue, it's been quite flat for a, for a number of years as we've been getting the technology ready. But you know, we did we kind of worked on our first commercial system, a company called um, C Power out in the in the states, and and then off the back of of that and and like that, it's been getting some more systems in the water. It's kind of built built up confidence, so we are growing fast. Um, I think um, moving forward, what we're going to see is um, and kind of what one of the big things for us is the fact that. Especially in, well, in offshore wind, curtailment is something that's happening a lot. And, and the curtailment's effectively when the wind farm could be generating power, but the grid can't accept it. So at the moment, the way the CFDs work, um, the wind farm operator losses in the UK, but generally the same most places to date, they just get paid to to not um, export the power. And that's really um, not making use of the capabilities moving forward. So I think where we're going to really see our market growing and we're just at the very kind of start of that is, is in the offshore wind market so starting to address some of the inefficiencies that are out there um maybe I shouldn't use the word efficiency because it gets um misinterpreted a lot but the there's a lot of capacity that in the future could be generated by some of our offshore wind infrastructure that isn't being utilized yet and so i think it will become much smarter and we want and we want to be right at the forefront of that and part of it um, and then also, you know, once you've got a, um, an offshore asset like a, a, a wind farm, um, you've got that effectively acreage. Um, so you you want to be able to make as much use of it as you can. And, and, and the offshore wind sector is very, um, you know, good at sort of marginal gains and small percentages to, to get things working to the optimum. Um, so I think what we'll start to see is things like the kind of multi-vector approach, where effectively you're taking different power generation sources and then you're making use of that export connection. So you are seeing some of the early stages of some pilots where people are then looking at coupling wave energy to a wind farm and coupling tidal, coupling other renewable sources. I think it'll move to a point where that will be the the way to effectively make use of the best use of the assets that they have in offshore wind farms. And, and to do that, you need some sort of management system. You need some form of uh, way of coupling all the sources and exporting and that's you nuts. Know, you need some sort of gateway interface point, which is what like our primary product Halo is. So um, you know, we want to be that system out in every wind farm helping pull all this together, manage it and getting the power out. And that and that effectively has the opportunity to make us, you know, a significant OEM in the future. Um, and that's kind of how you can see that pr progressive. Yeah. So but it's, it's not very often you get a new a new Vesta sort of seems mess and things, but you know, if we, and we're not looking to complete by making wind turbines a power generation. We're looking at being that kind of clever, smart bit that pulls it all, all together. So, who knows? Great. <laughs> yeah. And Richard, you know, it's quite a vision. Uh, what are the main challenges to achieving that? Um, well, like you mentioned, there's a huge speed of growth, um, and it, it's 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 kind of managing that in, in an unsustainable way. Um, it's also um, Getting the right talented people into the organisation, and then being able to to kind of get them up to up to speed. So if you just suddenly throw fifty people at us, then it's not going to work because they're not going to get a chance to integrate and things. So it's it's kind of stepping up the pace in terms of 
um, people coming into, into our organisation. Um, we've, we've got the benefit of, especially where we're located in, in Aberdeen, um, there's a great skills base and in the wider supply chain. So, you know, like manufacturing capability and things like that, there's a great, there's a great amount of um, capability within our area. And also things like um, control systems for subsea wells, you know, the, the, the components and things that are used in, in the school sets are either really, really similar to what we use for energy management systems. So that, we've got that benefit, but it's just, um, you know, everything's growing at the same time. We're, you know, we're effectively going into the next industrial revolution, I think. So it's just, it's just, just trying to kind of manage that growth and sustainable, in a sustainable way. Um, so. Great. And, and <laughs> is there anything more that Verloom can be doing to uh, ensure it's got the right skill base to to achieve the growth? Yeah, I mean, um, we haven't done it yet, but what we, you know, what we're kind of two of the big things that we really want to do is look at how um, we can set up and get ourselves positioned to set up an apprenticeship scheme. Um, so get the next generation of technicians coming through. Um, we're looking at how we can get a proper graduate scheme um, set up. Um, so kind of building our own own talent. So taking advantage of those who are who've got a lot of skills, existing skills, but you know maybe been done or you know haven't you know they're, they're available for work now, but then also using their ability to kind of train up the next generation, and start sort of building their own um, capabilities and starting starting from scratch. So they, you kind of need to be a size that it's big enough to take on people and train them up and have that capacity to do that and we haven't and haven't really in the past but um you know we, we have um had that capacity and we've we have had some some people but to do do it on a bigger scale then we really you know we're kind of approaching that point now and there are the sorts of things that um going kind of back to the discussion of the investment bank that they that, that's a real kind of positive for for them because it's about a just transition it's about getting the next generation of 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 people into the into the workplace, so we really kind of want to be part of that. Um, and you know, you mentioned a just transition <laughs> there, Richard. You know, why in a, in a, in the broader sense, why does the energy transition matter to you? I mean, if you take it as far back as a human race, if we're going to be successful, we need to be you know we need to be using sustainable energy. That's kind of I can't just kind of burn through all our resources and then go oh well that's it you know. <laughs> so um, and I think that. For me personally, um, I'm an engineer, so I've got the I kind of been lucky enough to, to gain the kind of skills that um, mean that it can help be be part of that. So, like if if I'm on my deathbed, you know, we say, "Well, what did you what did you achieve?" I don't want to be. I want to at least say be able to say, "Well, I did everything I could to try and help and try and do the right thing, and you know, try and try and get the energy transition." In place and, and and move to a more sustainable future. So, I think that's that's part of the driver for for me. And and I think you, know, you made reference to just transition. I think the really important thing is that you know we live in a global market and people often make reference to transition, saying it's a transition that does take time, and it does. That's correct. But also, we're not the only ones. And if we want to take advantage of um, all the skills that have been built up. For decades in the oil and gas industry, we need to be doing it as quick as we possibly can because if we don't do it, someone else is going to be doing it. And then there won't be a just transition, not because we're not transitioning, but because we haven't been at the forefront of that and we haven't pushed it forward. So there'll be other companies, there'll be other countries who have moved forward quicker than us. And then they're the ones that will be able to take advantage of what is going to be the new energy sector, however it, however it kind of plans out to be. So I think um, doing it as quickly as possible is the way that we will be able to um uh secure the job secure the future for, for what we're doing and that's um that you know there's, there's you know, we're sitting in a world at the moment where there's um the number of the level of unemployment is always that's kind of been for for a very long period of time so there's, there's plenty of people can can work in the existing oil and gas and make sure that we still keep the, the taps on but you know for the next generation coming through we wouldn't be able to have that transition where they get the benefit of all the skills and working with people that have worked in different sectors so that so they become a really kind of valuable resource and that kind of helps secure the economic future for us moving forward so it was maybe a bit deep but <laughs> there you go 
<laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine that um, being an energy transition leader in Verloom, being a technology innovator as well, would mean that you know, people would want to make their careers with a business like Verloom. Um, is that, have you found that? Uh, yeah, and I certainly hope so. I mean, that was the aspiration of the, you know, the business was that, yeah. Um, I mean, the easy, well, kind of 10 years ago, I was kind of looking to see how I could move my career actually, but I just, the company that I wanted to work for in my mind didn't exist. So I thought, well, I'm just going to have to set it up then. So, <laughs> so that's what we did. So, and, and that, yeah, so that, and that's kind of, yeah, it is. And I think, I think because, um, a number of people there have, have come from different backgrounds as well. It makes it a makes it an easy entry for for, for people. It's not it's not like changing into a different world. If you've if you've been a subsea engineer working in oil and gas all your days, you wouldn't find working for us the, the work environment that different. The products maybe are and what we're doing is, but um, the work environment. So I think it it's it's a kind of easy transition for people as well to kind of apply their skills in a, in, in, in a different way. And that's that's that's. We've tried to do that intentionally. Whether we've succeeded, well, only well, the future will tell. But you know, that's what we've tried to do. Anyway. Yeah, I think for me, Richard, it's an important point that that you make that it is an energy transition, and it is about transitioning knowledge and skills and capabilities and know-how. And the fact is, a lot of that has come from oil and gas. That industry for decades has kept the lights on, kept people warm, raised the standard of living for everyone. So it's you, you know we can't forget that. It's, but moving forward, it's, it's not sustainable as is, but, you know, um, that shouldn't mean that no one's kind of proud of what they've, what they've done in the past. And if they want to transition and work in a, in a, in a, in a different in, environment, then that's, that's great. Well, and, and Richard, um, you know, a few weeks back, we had the COP28 um, climate summit in Dubai. Um, and of course, we all look forward to finding out you know what happens in the next summit as well yeah. and at the next summit richard if you had the stage what would be your message to the world leaders <laughs> me. um i think that um well let me come out with a big speech but i think it's just about the pace of change it's inevitable we all kind of know that we need to um um move to transition, move to having a mix of different energy sources, and the quicker we do that, the less painful it's going to be. So let's just kind of get on with it. I mean, the the um, fundamentally we know that what needs to be done. So the quicker we do that, the um, the better. Um, so it's yeah, go go as fast as you possibly can. And also, um, the argument used to be that um, that the, the it was a it was a costly alternative, but if you look at the cost of solar, you look at the cost of offshore wind. It's now the it's, it's also the economically it's the way to go. So you know that argument doesn't doesn't stand any anymore. So it's um, you know the quicker the move the better. Absolutely. Good. And Richard, as you know, on this show, we try to support and inspire people who might want to make their careers in the energy transition. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, and so we really try and understand, you know, what drives the businesses that are leading the transition and the professionals who are leading those businesses. So I'd love to know, um, you know, what is your philosophy for success uh, for your team of Verloom? Yeah, for us, um, I think real success will be when we've seen um, that we've really established the business is, is um, you know, a, a, a large scale OEM globally. You know, we've got systems out there working with multiple, multiple wind firms, multiple renewable devices. You know, we're the de facto company to come to for any energy management or storage systems for, for offshore energy. And, and then we're supplying them here in the UK and we're supplying them all around the world. Um, and and uh, people who really recognise us as, as the leader in that field, because it is very much still so margin and we're for, at the forefront of that. But you know, moving forward, people think of us in the same way as they would if they're, if they're building a new offshore wind farm, where do they go and get the wind turbines? And you know, they'll come to us for, for storage systems. So yeah. Right. And how do you define success for yourself, Richard? Well, <laughs> that's a good one. Um, I think, well, for me, I guess professionally, taking something from nothing to an idea or to building a business, um, my success, partially, I'm mean, is directly tied to the business. So if the, if the business meets its targets, then I guess that's I've done my my, my job as well. So. Um, yeah, the two, the, they're one of the 
the same thing as far as I'm concerned too. Great. And, um, you know, you've been through quite a journey, you know, from oil and gas to founding the business in 2013 to, to where we are today. And, you know, keen to know what advice would you give your younger self just embarking on that career? <laughs> um, well, I don't know. Something to say ignorance is bliss because I, I, I saw the I saw the statistics on um, the likelihood of the business succeeding through its first and second year and third year, etc. After it already started the business and the failure rate was like something ridiculous, like ninety percent. So if I knew that, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I'm sure I would have started it, but um, but then I wouldn't want it to go back and tell my earlier self that because I'm glad I did. You know, it might have been it might have been a painful journey, but you learn a lot about it. But um, I don't know. I think maybe just to have the just have the kind of faith and the confidence to stick at it because we've been at it a long time. It's taken a long time before we became really commercial, a lot of years to develop the technology. Um, that, that's been difficult where the outcome's not been um, not been certain. It has been high risk. Um, and you know that, that's reflected in the sort of investors that we have because they invest in high risk businesses. But I think um, maybe just to, yeah, just to say stick at it. You know, you'll, you'll get there eventually. So, yeah. Brilliant. Stick at it. Keep yeah. going. Good advice. Yeah. And, you know, Richard, as you know, in each episode of the Let's Talk Transition podcast, yeah. we ask our guests to set a question for the next guest without knowing who they're going to be. Um, yeah. And, you know, coincidentally, in the last episode, we met another Aberdeen based uh, professional, uh, Dr. Alf Martinez from the Just Transition Lab at the University of Aberdeen. And he left the following questions for you. Okay. Um, first of all, what role is hydrogen going to take in the energy transition? Should you, and actually, I should say this first question is a bit of a um, composite question. So, what is the role of hydrogen in the energy transition? Should we just bet for green hydrogen or diversify hydrogen sources like low carbon hydrogen from natural gas? Right. Okay. So, I'm not uh, an expert in hydrogen, but um, I think hydrogen will definitely feature. Um, in, the, in the future, because there is no single, single one bullet for for everything. I think the, the energy system is going to be a real mix. Um, so primarily, you're going to need hydrogen is a very good storage medium um, at, at a really large scale when it gets to things like seasonal. So we're going to need it like that. Um, when in terms of betting, I guess it goes back to the next point. The easy answer, especially in the early days of sort of the energy transition was everyone wanted to bet on what it was the next going to be the next big thing but it's not going to be just just one thing so i wouldn't bet on one thing you kind of need to try and move both of them forward but that's that's hydrogen from from gas it's sort of like sort of fossil fuel based gas that you then you inject the co2 so there's no emissions or green hydrogen you're going to need both you're going to need green hydrogen systems for balance and power anyway so and the other thing with hydrogen is there's a lot of people forget there's there's a lot of talk of people trying to create a hydrogen market and convert different things to use hydrogen. There's already an existing hydrogen market out there that exists. So, um, you know, trying to address the existing hydrogen market with green hydrogen straight away is is a good way of going. But um, you're going to need it from from all sources really, uh, and, and it'll evolve. So who knows if it's going to be VHS or Betamax that that becomes the the best way to go. But it's you're probably going to need both of them. So. So I wouldn't, wouldn't bet on either of them. And then there was a next, was there more question to that? There was, the there was, there was another question too, which was, uh, what's the role the oil and gas companies have in the energy transition? They've got a huge, huge role, and a lot of that is to do with the fact that um, they've got the skills and capabilities to allow, allow delivering a lot of this. You know, they, you especially see it in the European major, which would have been oil and gas operators, but are now classing themselves as energy operators. I mean, you can there's there's a route where for us I guess we had a lot a bunch of individuals who um a decade ago worked in that sector and then set up our own company. But then why and a lot of these businesses can diversify themselves now. Now that now it's quite clear where the market's going, we were kind of ahead of the game by quite some period of time. But um those they are part definitely part of the answer. Um and I think to underestimate their capabilities is just shooting ourselves in, in the foot. So the more that they're engaged and the more they're part of it, and you see a lot happening and you see it happening much more now, the, the, the better. So it's, it's definitely, I think, what should be, should be encouraged. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and and of course, for me, the oil and gas companies generally have got huge amounts of capital to bring to the market as well. So that's uh, yeah. You know, there's their expertise and their financial clout as well, which which we've seen coming into you know, investment and in engagement in projects like yours, but yeah. also in the offshore wind industry and, and and lots of other sectors too. Yeah. You know, they're really, really good at um, um, delivering large scale capital projects. You know, what's their capabilities? They're, they're really good at executing large scale capital projects. They're really, really good at um, operating systems reliable and safety for years. They're, you know, they're the resource that they are used to, um, I guess, exploiting is hydrocarbon reserves, but that doesn't mean that they can't be good at exploiting other resources as well and taking some of that set in there. So no, I think it's, I think it's, there's a lot um, from Companies who have come from being more utility companies working in offshore wind and then also on gas companies. I think that's there's no, you know, there's no reason why they why they shouldn't and, and be part of that. And I think they should be in the cost as much as they can. Great. And Richard, ahead of recording today, I asked if you would set a question for our next guest. Yeah, I did. And I have it written down here, so I'll make sure I don't, I don't forget. So it was Great. right there, wasn't it? I have. Yeah, so I mean, I kind of spoke a lot about, and you touched on it as well. But um, this is a question I'm going to set for the next person: Is how how can we ensure that Northeast of Scotland plays a leading role in the energy transition? Okay. okay. How so? How the Northeast of Scotland can play a leading role in the energy transition? And of course, there's lots of work being done around well, there is, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there so. definitely is. Good. Well, I'll look forward to asking that. I think it'll be, we'll just be asking it next week of our next guest. So I'll be most interested to find out okay. um, what their take is. Um, good. So, Richard, you know, it's been really interesting. You know, today we found out about Verloom and um, the concept of subsea energy storage, which I, for one, now understand much better as to why we would want to um, store energy in the sub. On, on the seabed, first of all, yeah. you know, and secondly, what those use cases are. It's been interesting, too, to find out about the growth of your business. It sounds to me like one of those overnight success stories that's taken a good 10 years to, yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> to, decade. to come about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, brilliant. So, look, that brings us to the end of the recording today. Uh, Richard, I'd like to thank you, Richard Knox, Chief Executive Officer at Verloom, for, for joining us today. That's okay. Thanks for your time. Find it interesting. Thanks, Molly. And you know, as always, everybody, you know, I'm keen to get um, feedback on uh, on each episode, uh, suggestions for future um, guests, um, themes and topics and areas. What questions would you like me to be asking of the leaders of our energy transition? Um, so, do get in touch. A lot of you get in touch through LinkedIn, which is brilliant. Or you can email me. It's Murray, that's M-O-R-A-Y, at anakconsulting.com. And if you would like to see or listen to some of our other episodes, you'll find them on ogv.energy, on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and anywhere else you would like to find your podcasts. So in the meantime, everybody, thank you very much, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye.